You're now listening to Sound Talent Media. Check out more shows at SoundTalentMedia.com. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Forget the frustration of picking commerce platforms when you switch your business to Shopify. The global commerce platform that supercharges your selling wherever you sell. With Shopify, you'll harness the same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash tech. Hey there. Did you know Kroger always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Kroger app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Kroger today. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Brooks Running has a new shoe for you runners out there. Did you hear that? Better turn up your volume. In fact, turn it up to the max. Introducing the all-new Ghost Max. It's got all kinds of things to make your knees and ankles feel protected, like Max Cushion, Max Soft Landings with DNA Loft V2 Foam, and Max Smooth Rides with their Glide Roll Rocker. Feel better on your run with Ghost Max. Learn more at brooksrunning.com. What is up, good people? Welcome to the show today. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thanks for hanging out, and thanks for always being there. I super appreciate you, and I literally couldn't do it without you. So. Thank you very much for tuning in and keeping this thing still chugging after all these years. It's really amazing that I get to do this, and it's all because of you. So thank you. This episode, uh, it went places that I suppose I should have saw coming, but ultimately I was kind of planning on more of a deep dive into Jordan himself, but we really, really dug into social media, like the nitty-gritty behind trying to make social media your job. And I think this applies to musicians, creators of any sort, people who manage stuff for brands. It's it's a weird world and it's constantly changing almost no matter what platform you're talking about. And he's done a amazing job at executing over on TikTok. He currently has well over a million followers. He learned how to I guess for lack of a better term, make the algorithm work to his advantage over there. And he's really blown up in a very short amount of time. So he's a person that I would defer to when referring to that platform specifically. But he's also a really smart dude, amazing guitar player. This dude absolutely rips. So definitely go check him out on whatever platform you are on and follow Jordan because he's awesome. One quick thing before we get into this, I just want to do a quick reminder about the text chat that goes along with this show. If you text 503-751-8577, you're going to get an automated message that, you know, has you opt into it, and then everything else is direct from me. How it usually works is I'll send out a broadcast text to the whole group, and these are individual conversations, but it will go out to the whole group, and then whoever responds to it we'll just start chatting. We'll just start having a a chat and you can text me through there. So far, my batting average is pretty good. I'm responding to everyone. I do not believe I have missed a text from that text chat. It might take me a little bit to get back to you, but I always will. And it's been a really, really cool thing that I've done with the podcast and uh, unexpectedly very valuable and very fun. And we talk about everything on there. So uh, a lot of people are sharing their music. A lot of people are, you know, asking questions. Uh, sometimes I asked the other day uh, if anybody had any throat remedies for me because I had a podcast coming up and I couldn't talk. So it could be anything. But 503-751-8577 if you want to text me directly. So, yeah. That's enough plugging. That's enough talking. I will shut up so that I can continue to talk to Jordan. Let's do this. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Tone Mob Podcast, the show about guitar stuff occasionally, sometimes. I'm your host, Blake Wyland, and with me today, I have Jordan Dot Wave. What is going on, man? Not too much. How are you? 
like I usually say, we're just going to pretend we didn't talk for 10 minutes before this and uh, <laughs> roll into the episode. For sure. Thank you. For sure. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. This is awesome. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. So, you know, my crowd, you know, they're they're the podcasting crowd. So they may not be quite as familiar with the, the whole TikTok world as maybe we all should be, myself included. But you got really popular on TikTok. And my friend Grant from Big Ear Pedals introduced me to your stuff. And I'm like, this is this is brilliant. Actually, Brian Wampler also from Wampler Pedals showed me your stuff early on. So yeah, like yeah, you're you're making waves. That's no crazy. I want I want Brian to start responding to my comments. <laughs> is Brian not responding to your comments? I'll get in, I'll get him in trouble. Like I'll make fun of him on the next uh, Jason. I was podcast. I was surprised to see him on so early, right? Because you know, I, I typically do like little searches to see which pedal companies and which guitar companies are like early to the train. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even early on, you'd see they've made profiles, right? Like a lot of them are on there already and they've kind of reserved their names, but they yeah. haven't posted anything, right? So seeing Brian on there so early, posting, making actual content from not just like the Wampler corporate account, but also from like a personal account, mm -hmm. it's pretty cool. And like, I see he's probably like as an early adopter is doing really well on the platform. You you can imagine uh Brian is a follower of the Gary V. So you can you can imagine that 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 has a lot to do with it. Uh back when Snapchat was really hot, I remember he was also like probably the only pedal company other than Grant uh <laughs> on yeah. Snapchat at the time. And so like he's always testing things. He's always trying things out and seeing what works and a fan he's of the, found the rise and grind culture. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Like he, he's always trying to figure out what works. And he also found that he just really likes TikTok. He talks about it on Chasing Tone all the time. He's just like, I love TikTok. It's great. <laughs> and we, we were trying to figure out why, because I'm, I'm more of a like long format guy. Like I really love podcasts, obviously. Yeah. Uh, so I, I always gravitate towards like, oh, this is three hours long. Cool. I'll, it'll take me a week to finish it, but I, I like the large, the large bites. And Brian, he said it on the on the air. He was like, "I think it's because my brain only works in thirty second spurts." He's constantly like squirrel, like what? And so like TikTok's great for him because he gets his entertainment or information in these little things, and he's on to the next thing. He's on to the next. He's actually yeah. like really loves the platform. So I think that's that has a lot to do with why he's so active on it. I think, Brian, if you're listening to this, text me and tell me I'm wrong if that's uh, incorrect. But but you, you seem to have like really fully embraced it. Like you were talking off, off the mic about how you do it. You make sure you do at least one a day and you do lives a lot. Like you really, really have, you know, taken to it like a duck to water, but maybe let's rewind. And before we get into yeah. like what your thoughts are on it and all that, like, how did you, how did you get started with all this stuff? Well, like a lot of other guitar creators, right? It starts with Instagram. Mm -hmm. So like you'd see all those viral videos of people posting themselves and there's the, you know, like some names that come to mind are like Kafir uh, Ochan. Yeah. I'm yeah, not really sure right. how to pronounce his name, but like, all those other viral players that you would constantly see and like my sort of desire to get to that level. Right. Um, and it really started as like somewhat of a diary of like my own playing to sort of see my own progression. But then after a while you start seeing people that like it and people that resonate it and people that are like repeat commenters and you start kind of making posts more tailored to them. And then it kind of died down a bit until I got into my own pedal making. And then it mm -hmm. became trying to show off my gear and my pedals and making cool sounds and all the crazy stuff that, you know, you can make out of that, right? And it all becomes content after a while, which is the beauty of it. But it's also kind of like the insidious part of it is like, you know, when you're playing guitar, there's always the pressure to make content, right? Mm -hmm. And grow your brand. And then around like COVID time is when my Instagram started really picking up some steam like I started getting some posts that were actually like hitting hard, which was great. And then uh, my girlfriend actually introduced me to TikTok because she was on it and I wasn't on it. And like there was a whole stigma among people my age. I'm 25 <laughs> now. So at the time I would have been like 23. 
And she showed me, she's like, it's great. Like I love TikTok. She'd keep on sending me memes from TikTok. And I'd say, why are you sending me these? Like, I'm not going to check them. I'm not going to download the app until I finally caved. Cause she was like, this is a new thing. Eventually you're going to migrate towards it. Right. Right. Like there's more and more guitarists and more and more music people, not just dancing kids who are joining this app. <laughs> there's a reason for that. Like you should at least reserve your, your username. So I did. And then I made my first post and like, you know, you don't get a lot of, a lot of love on them either way. But I eventually started trying to migrate content over there. I was eventually just reposting all of my Instagram stuff. And you slowly realize like no one, no one cares about guitar there. Like they want to, they want something fun. They want something shareable. You know, that's like what's emphasized. That's what's praised on the app. Uh, and then I learned that when I posted my frog pedal, which was like the first iteration of it, it was essentially just like a very, very short video of like, making a pedal that sounds like a frog. And that was like my first viral <laughs> post. Um, like people went crazy over it. Like I think I got like 2000 shares within the first day. And I kind of, at that moment kind of clicked as like, this is the kind of stuff that people like here. And then you slowly learn that like when one post does well, it's best to sort of capitalize on the, uh, the momentum of that post, right? Like if you make a, a good post that people are really, really responding to, people are sharing, people are liking, you can, this was a feature that was on TikTok before it was on Instagram, but you can respond to comments in the mm -hmm. post so that when people go to the comments, they see more videos that are linked to that post. And, you know, the, co the comment culture and the comment uh, layout in TikTok is a lot more friendly than Instagram. And oftentimes with certain posts, right, the comments are even better than the posts themselves, which is something that you didn't really see with Instagram, right? So... You know, that was a way to sort of boost the popularity of certain videos by by riding on the momentum of already successful posts, which is crazy. Like, it's just a it's a completely different way to navigate uh, your online presence. And I just kind of felt like the power of of TikTok, like really feeling it, it kind of hacks your brain It kind of hijacks and it gets the dopamine running in a way that Instagram never did, which is exciting for brands. It would be exciting for marketers, but like for the average human, it's dangerous, I would say. <laughs> and, you know, you see that with the stats because one of the biggest differences, TikTok's user base is still much smaller than Instagram, but they find that the average amount of time that someone spends after opening the app is like tenfold compared to Instagram. It's a lot more engaging and it, it sucks you right in because like when you go on Instagram, you see the posts of people that you follow and they're trying to change this, right? Like with reels and with showing content that's related to hashtags rather than people you follow. Because the whole point of Instagram is you see what you sign up for. Like if yeah. you follow a certain number of people, that's the content you're going to see. And in theory, yeah. <laughs> in theory, in theory, yeah. yes. Like you still see promoted <laughs> posts. You see, now they're trying to show you hashtags. But in theory, like the, the most you're going to see is just static images, which are increasingly becoming boring to you know, meme consumers like myself or, you know, like Gen Z, I've, I've found nowadays and like, you know, people that I've spoken to as anecdotal evidence have found that like, whenever I get sent a picture meme, it just doesn't really, doesn't really do it for you as like the sort of video format that is the standard on TikTok. So like on Instagram, when you're seeing stuff that's curated for you by your friends, like, I don't think people care what their friends are doing anymore. Like, I don't, I don't really care to see that my friends went out for drinks the other day or, you know, that my friends up at the cottage, like when I'm trying to sedate myself with, with online content, I'm looking for funny stuff or I'm looking for new stuff or something interesting or seeing an artisan work their craft or some kind of meme. And I think TikTok really satisfies that. Whereas Instagram is, is really just not keeping up. Um, I lost my train of thought. Where is it trying to go with this? Um, well, well, you you you've hit on a couple <laughs> things though because like I'm I'm realizing like how much of a weirdo I am because like TikTok has tried to suck me in many times and I can I can recognize by the amount of like notifications they send and email the way they format their emails and the way they yeah. process thing they've really tried to suck me in and I I see how it works I get it and it's smart but I'm also yeah. like. I think a little bit um, numb or maybe what's the word like 
hesitant's not a good word, but like I'm always just like scratching my chin every time I get an email. Basically, like, what's going on here? What is this? It doesn't matter what it is. It does. It could be for something I signed up for. I'm always yeah. just kind of like, hmm. And TikTok, I'm like, I see what you're doing. You're really reaching and trying to grab, and it almost repels me in a weird way. And I don't know if that's a, just a me thing, or if it's a like, like I'm not that much older than you, but I'm just a little bit older than you. So I wonder if it's like a generational thing in some ways, because they. I don't like, like, I don't, I genuinely don't really like the platform that well. Like That's it fair. hasn't, it hasn't tailored itself. I, it's probably because I haven't spent just a ton of time in it compared to others. Like where you're like, I don't really care about a picture meme. I still love picture memes. Yeah. You know, like, and like the, the videos on TikTok in general, like we talked about just before we, we hopped on here, they don't. I'm a long form guy and they don't tend to, they're too short for me to actually like, I'll just get the nugget of information I want. And I'm like, wait, there's more to that story. What's going on here. And by then it's gone. Maybe even two or three videos are gone. And then like, it's just kind of like a blip in my brain. And so when I'm like sedating myself with, with content online, it's usually in the form of like long form audio pod podcasts generally. I'm a fan of the format. That's like why I do what I do. And uh, I'm I'm needing to understand TikTok better yeah. for my own like career. Like I, gen I genuinely need to get this. And I'm constantly finding myself like, what? I am old man yelling at cloud over here. Like I do not understand. Your videos make sense to me. I get why that's entertaining, but I get a lot of like bad financial advice popping up and like just things that don't mean anything to me. Like there's, it's getting slightly better, but it's kind of weird for me as a, as a format. I, I, I don't fully embrace it yet. I'm waiting for it to click the way it has for you and the way it has for Wampler. Um, but you not only enjoy it, you also like understand how to use it to your advantage, which is a big difference between, I think that's a huge difference between you and the average user. Which is well, like, I don't think, I personally don't think anyone fully understands it. Like, I don't think it's really something to be understood in, in such a way. Like, you know, a, a lot of things that pop up on my page are like advice on how to grow your brand, what trending sounds to use, stuff like that. And the more of these I see, the more I'm kind of convinced, like, no one actually knows what they're doing. And TikTok itself, like the update, the, the, terms of service and community guidelines and whatnot are constantly changing and they're constantly adapting their platform to become a bit more like market friendly, investor friendly. They're trying to move away from that stigma of like what it was in the beginning where like, you know, I remember at the start of 2020, there was this whole scare of like TikTok is infecting your phone. It's going to destroy everything. It's going to take all your information. And it's kind of like, wasn't Instagram already doing that? Like, wasn't Facebook already doing this? Like, wasn't every single... If you think tech companies are your friends, you're wrong. Um, and TikTok, like, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and be like, it's better. It's an amazing alternative. It's different. I think it's cool. I personally like it. I trust it to sort of bring my own brand and my own content and the message that I want to spread further than those other apps. It has definitely done a lot more for, for me. So, like, there's my bias. Um, no, I, yeah, get I don't it. think, yeah, I don't think yeah. anyone fully understands the whole, like how to go viral thing. Yeah, it, it does seem, I, I will say this, and this is sort of true for Instagram too. For me, the less effort I put into a post, the better it tends to do. And the harder yeah. I try and the better I try to make it, the worse it does. Like that's not entirely true. Like we talked about the the one kind of viral thing I had was about the mini bar pedal where you put different yeah. liquids in it. And I literally was just like, I was literally like just eating pizza and like going like, oh, I got this pedal here. I bet this would make a entertaining TikTok. I like I literally was doing it one handed. It took me like 30 seconds and like it went. That was my first indication that, oh, wow, this platform really does have some some power behind it because it got like 200 something thousand, which is nothing compared to what some of your videos have done. But for somebody just 
about to fall asleep <laughs> in For their sure. kitchen. I was like, oh, wow, okay. And, you know, it's it's just so strange to me that that kind of quality versus quantity, you know, is sort of inverse on that platform versus maybe maybe YouTube. I guess anything that grabs people's attention, yeah. you know, can it doesn't matter how good it is as long as it's attention grabbing, it can go go quite viral. But I've just I've always noticed like, man, I put a lot of time into this video. I hope it does really well and like well, you're never. not wrong, but I I do take some issue with that sentiment because that's something mm -hmm. I've definitely heard with you know, I'm on like a couple Discord communities and I'm talking to creators a lot. And yeah. one thing that I do hear is people saying like, why was it this one that blew up? Like I just finished like, you know, an hour long film shoot of like, you know, this song with crazy editing and these cool special effects and whatnot. It gets no attention. And then I just kind of like, I open up a can of, a can of beans and it, it goes viral <laughs> and people kind of get it in their head that like, that's the way to go. But you know, you, you have to realize that there's tons and tons of people making tons and tons of low content uh, like posting lots of low content videos that are funny that probably could go viral all day, but like it just doesn't hit the algorithm. It doesn't get sent out to the right people. So mm -hmm. like, I don't think there's that. And if you look at the most watched videos on the platform, they're by this guy, Zach King. And they're really, really interesting, uh, like special effects videos that are kind of like skits, but they use these very, very cool uh, like set design with special effects where it's like people walking into walls and jumping into mirrors. And it's like, it probably took like months to edit and shoot and film and like with technology and lots of know-how on how to do this. So like, I don't think there's anything wrong with putting lots of effort into your videos because like in the end, it's just, you're, you're, you're a slave to an algorithm. Like it's dumb luck. It's mm -hmm. whoever, cause I'm not sure you know, how many, how many people listening to this would sort of understand how the TikTok algorithm works. But from my understanding, which it may have changed at the time of this going out, <laughs> of course, but like, you know, based on your own following already, and based on the relevant hashtags you use, and based on just random luck of who it sends it out to the second you post something, TikTok automatically sends it out to a certain number of people. And the way those people interact with it, like whether they like it, whether they share it, whether they watch the full thing all the way through, dictates how it's going to treat it further and whether it's going to send it out to more people. And, you know, the, the success of your video essentially hinges on that. And this has kind of led to, you know, basically that format of how TikTok sends things out has, you know, set trends in itself, right? Mm -hmm. Like there was a trend a couple weeks ago where, all these musicians had it in their head that, oh, if I make a post where it's only five seconds long, or no, seven seconds long, exactly on the dot, and I put a lot of on-screen text, then it's going to go viral because people are going to try and read the text. They're going to struggle to read it. They're not going to finish it. The video is going to elapse and it's going to count as a view. And they're like, oh, this is a secret hack. This is a trick. And then tons and tons of people did it for the longest time, that's all I saw on my feed were musicians posting the long text and me not being able to read it. <laughs> and what do you know? They did not go viral. So like, you know, it, it, it's not just one metric. People have to share it. People have to like it. People have to actually engage with it. And those are the sorts of metrics that people aren't hitting. In that way, it's not all that different from YouTube, from what I understand. Now we're, yeah. I think we're both kind of just hypothesizing over here because neither of us work for TikTok or YouTube, but YouTube does the same thing from my understanding. Like they, you publish something, they send it out to a set number of people and see how it does. And that's why, you know, YouTube is actually really interesting because it's the only platform and granted, I, I'm putting more effort into it this year. I've said this for years, but this year it's really true. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm putting more effort into it this year. Uh, because it's still the only platform that I, every time I post a video, I get new subscribers, like every single time. And it doesn't even matter if it's not that great of a, of a video, you know, like I've been doing some shorts that like basically repurposing some of my IG content. And yeah. even when I do that, it's like, oh yeah, I got a couple new subscribers today, you know? And I just did that just to try it. I didn't really think that shorts were probably going to work on YouTube all that well because that's not what the audience over there has been conditioned to want to watch, right? Yeah. 
they're just trying to copy TikTok. <laughs> and, uh, but YouTube, I think, does the same thing. And I don't know that everybody understands that. Like when you see something, so this is a sort of a, I guess, just pulling the curtain back a little bit. But if you have a, a creator that you really enjoy on any platform, and you see one of their videos, even if you don't have time to watch it right now, just like do something with it, like it, do something, yeah. you know, because a, that will give the algorithm the indication that you want to see more of it. And B, <clears throat> it will, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I'm really <clears throat> not on my A game today. <clears throat> it's all good. Woo. It's rough. That almost never happened. <clears throat> I hope I'm not coming down with something. Uh, and B, <laughs> it will also help that creator. And it will, like, it, it's, a, it's a tiny thing, but it's a thing. Like, if a creator gets no engagement with any of their posts ever, even if you really like that person, it's going to be detrimental to them, you know, long term in the content creation space. It's Everything's becoming algorithmic, except for podcasts. That's the only thing that hasn't truly became algorithmic yet. And I think it's starting to slant that way. Yeah. If, if you look at how Spotify and Apple are starting to treat RSS feeds, everything's starting to go that way, which is, I think, both good and bad. Well, I think with podcasts, um, they serve a different purpose, right? Like, mm -hmm. if I'm driving to work every morning for an hour, I'm not going to listen to TikToks on the way there. Like, right. it's a more, it's a more contempl like contemplative, kind of almost therapeutic in some ways, like just having a voice that you're familiar with talking about something that interests you, right? Because uh, maybe, maybe this is a, a testament to my short attention span, but a lot of the times when I'm listening to podcasts, I'm kind of like drifting in and out of it, right? I think that's natural. I think everybody does that. Exactly. Like when it's not a one-on-one a -on -one conversation, it's it's not like every single word you're hanging off of it, unless it's like an audiobook or something with a very engaging story, right? But, you know, the, the podcasts that I'm mainly familiar with are like these kind of, the dollop, which is like a comedy history podcast. And like, it's just kind of having the two voices of like the two familiar people who are talking and riffing about about different times in history. Like it, it, it doesn't sort of fill, fill that need for you know mainlining dopamine from content right it's more of a, <laughs> of a slow burn kind of steady like setting a mood setting an ambience it's almost similar to listening to to music like putting on an album yeah it's almost a for me it's most of my podcast listening happens when i'm trying to do something else that i don't really want to do whether that's yeah. driving or digging in the backyard or whatever it is it's like put my headphones on to distract me from the fact that i don't want to be doing this right now <laughs> which for sure. is Turns out I do a lot of things I don't want to do because I listen to a lot of podcasts. But yeah. um, I think you're right. You know, uh, Instagram and TikTok for sure. And Facebook to maybe a lesser degree is what you do when you're waiting in line for the grocery store, right? Or exactly what you do while you're waiting for something to reheat in the microwave. Like it's a now thing. Yeah. And like, you know, for podcasts, I, I feel like an algorithm wouldn't, be so powerful for them because it's it, there's more of a patronage there. There's more of like, there's a podcast that you listen to every week and you return to it or like every day or however long it takes for them to make the podcast, right? It's not like people are bouncing around between different podcasts, right? Well, I'm sure there are people that do listen to them long form, but like from my experience as someone that's a very casual podcast listener, like I have one or two that I listen to consistently. And, mm -hmm. you know, if a friend tells me, maybe check out this one. It's not like I go and I, uh, you know, bounce around different podcasts and enjoy all kinds of content, right? Because there's not enough hours in the day to do that. I think that really depends on, honestly, like the job that you have. Yeah. I know a lot of people like I, we've got like truck drivers that listen to this show and they listen to it sometimes multiple times. And I know for a fact, like when I, I have a text group that goes along with this this podcast and I've sent out before like give me your podcast recommendations and they all have like multiple and I think it's a lot of a lot of people who whether it's job related or commute related or whatever they spend a lot of time with headphones on and genuinely love the format kind of similar to what I do 
I don't spend as much time with headphones because I and I don't really have a commute. But every time I get in the car, first thing I do is start the car, find podcast, like yeah, whatever one that may be. So I listen to you know probably ten different ones fairly consistently, and but like you said, but only two or three that I make sure every single time I get every single episode. So it's it's a it's definitely a, fills a different need, and even even more so than YouTube. I think in some ways, I, I, I feel like YouTube creators, it's more, at least from how I consume it, it's more subject based. I'm like, oh, what did Rhett Scholl say about this thing that I've been curious about? I trust that guy, you know, and I'll go find yeah. it, you know, or, oh, I've been wondering about that pedal. Let me see if any of my favorite demo people have demoed it. It's, it's more of a search driven thing for me. I don't think that's that way for everybody. I think there are people who sit on YouTube all day, you know in the corner of their screen while they do their accounting or whatever. Yeah. But it's, it's really interesting to just analyze and think about how all these different platforms sort of infiltrated our lives and how they, how you actually use them as a consumer, because we're all consumers at some level and everyone uses everything so much, so differently. And as a creator, you have to be conscious of that. Oh, for sure especially like uh, in tailoring your content, right? In terms of like each platform has a, a very, very different need. And I think that's what makes a lot of different, uh, you know, creators who are migrating to TikTok from like YouTube or from Instagram, they don't really understand the landscape and they don't really understand that there's like a language that they need that's to me. start speaking. Yeah, that's me for sure. Yeah, well, it's not just you. Like in terms of, there's lots of really, really amazing guitarists that like I remember from from Instagram, and I see them now posting a year later, and like their their pages aren't getting tons of traction. They're getting lots of love from people who recognize them, right? But you know, the the the, the, the sad thing is, or not, it's not a sad thing. I don't want to say like I, I'm not trying to make any you know actual judgments on these, but like qualitative judgments, but like the average user of TikTok, like the average young, you know, 15 year old kid doesn't really appreciate like the, the artistry of it. And right. You know, they don't know who the the amazing guitarists like Ben Yunsen or Ariel Posen, like they don't know who they are. And if that person isn't posting themselves doing, you know, something weird or making (laughs) memes, they're not going to sort of get that traction. That's going to blow up their account and accelerate them and actually get them attention. That's worth you know, marketing their music on there, right? So do you, th- this is actually a really, really interesting thing to dive into with you because you've had so much success in a relatively short time on that platform. How do you see that translating into marketing your music or how do you see creators being able to utilize that? Because, you know, you got known for a pretty specific thing right off the bat, which was, you know, you know, making your guitar run through different things and sound weird, you know? And I thought they were hilarious and awesome. But I do, like, struggle for, from my perspective, like, okay, how does that translate into the bigger picture? Because that's not going to be a forever thing. And I know that's not the whole of your personality, clearly. (laughs) Uh, So how does that, how do you take that audience and get them kind of on board with the things you really, really care about? Well, that's essentially what I did from the start in terms of like uh, when I started making those posts and when they caught a lot of traction, there were certain sounds that people latched onto. Mm -hmm. And one of those sounds actually just happened to be in the like debut EP that I was making or the debut single I was making. So I kind of said like, hey, if you want to hear more of this, I made a song. It was the orange. Like when I ran my guitar through an orange, Mm -hmm. it sounded very like envelope filtery and octave up E. And, you know, people, people were like, this is such a great song. Make something out of it. So that's you know, kind of what got people thinking, I'm going to check out this guy's music, right? Yeah. You have to, when you build an audience that wants a certain niche, you have to feed that niche, right? That's part of the, that's kind of like rule one of community building, right? Like if you build an audience <laughs> based on one thing and then you try and sell them something else, they don't care. Yeah. You know, like I'm, I'm fairly open about the fact that I have like a, a very, very substantial following, but like, you know, my numbers on Spotify do not reflect that following. I hear because that. Because <laughs> I also, I think that like, while TikTok is a great place to 
market your music, it's already been taken by labels. Like everything's paid for. Trending sounds are very, very much paid for. I think people would be surprised by, you know, the monetary exchanges that have, have taken place to get certain songs in front of your face, right? Whereas people who are artists who see this platform as like, this is the best way to market my music. The chances of that are probably the same chances of like you becoming famous just by, by hard work, the old fashioned way. Because um, <laughs> on average, I don't think people go on TikTok to discover new music, right? No. People who are looking to discover music, they, you know, recommendations from friends, from you know, the radio, their parents' tastes, stuff like that. I don't, at least in my perspective, like I don't go on TikTok being like, I'm going to see what new music is there. Like for me, it's usually whatever Spotify recommends after I, my, you know, it takes me off the playlist and it drags me onto the algorithmic playlists and anything like that. That's how I discover my new music nowadays. But in terms of kids, like the the songs that are trending, that are brought in front of your face, labels will pay influencers to use those songs mm -hmm. so like if you're not sort of at that level in that circle then the chances of your song actually like trending and blowing up and starting to you know get you tons and tons of recognition as a creator are very slim or you have to have like a truly amazing song and you know the way that this sort of affects people is people are kind of conditioned to the format of tiktok songs right where a lot of the ones that are kind of serendipitous and not planted. And I don't like, you know, saying industry plants and using the word industry plant because I don't really, I, I, I feel like that's become a new standard now. And like, I think Anthony Fantano said it in a good way where he's like, if you think that something has just kind of come across you without any sort of, um, you know, marketing to get it there, then it's a bit of a naive take, right? Like everything <laughs> is marketed in some way. Everything is planted to some degree. Even this um, podcast, being totally honest, like the reason I do everything is to get people to check this out. This is what I yeah. love to do, you know? So the fact that I posted some riff video on Instagram, you know, sure, I thought that was cool and, and worth sharing. But ultimately, I hope that like one person who saw that might come download an episode because this is what I really, this is ultimately what I want people to get to, you know? For sure, yeah. And, and I'm sure there's somebody listening to this right now that saw a piece of my content somewhere on the internet and it magically funneled down to here. And this was the ultimate goal. And being totally transparent, that's a form of marketing. Yeah. Like you're trying to get people to your thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's good and bad ways to do those things. So I think that that is an excellent observation. Like, yeah. really. Well, I like, continue on with that other point. Like, the way people are making songs now is they are trying to make songs for TikTok, right? Like the way the song is structured, it will typically have some sort of message that people will, you know, they're made with the sharing part already in mind. They want mm -hmm. people to have that on in the background. They'll make a song that's like, oh, this would be good for fashion TikToks. Or they'll make a song, oh, this would be good for sad breakup TikToks. And that kind of shapes the whole music that people want to hear. And I think this is a very, very like prevalent point with the fact that TikTok is now making its own distribution service slash label. So I'm interested in seeing how that kind of affects the whole thing with TikTok music moving forward. Because like, if you're a creator on that app, why wouldn't you use SoundOn? Why wouldn't you use it? Like, I feel like most people would assume that that's the best way to increase your uh, like your reach, because of course, TikTok is going to want to start promoting songs and building up songs that are on their own platform. They're going to want to legitimize it. Of course. So like as a creator, as someone that's primarily making content to, to market your music, of course, you're going to work with the place or your primary, uh, like, of course, you're going to use the label of the place that is marketing your music. That I didn't realize they were doing that. So that's a really good point and it's called sound on i assume it's called sound on it's relatively yeah. new i think it's only like i'm not sure if it's been released yet um but yeah tiktok sound on is their distribution service so it's going to be competing with uh like distro kid and tune core and all of those things so once and sorry like, i know this is going on a, a ton of tangents no this is great this is great i love it but one of the other difficulties in terms of uh, 
you know, being an artist on TikTok is for certain artists, like uh, the verification system of TikTok. Like this is a very, very like, you know, wide issue with a lot of different kind of facets, but there's verification on, you know, all different types of social media platforms, but usually you have to request it. And with TikTok, you can't request it. There's no real, it's, it's kind of vague on purpose. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes it's through, you know, whatever management company will have an, a contact at TikTok and they will say like, hi, we want this band or artist to be verified. Or sometimes if you're verified on other platforms, then it's automatic on TikTok. But like for the most part, there's tons of people who are just kind of like leaving comments on their favorite creators being like, why aren't you verified? And the creators don't know because there's tons of imposter accounts popping up for them all the time, right? Like I have an imposter account. I don't know why I'm not verified. That would definitely help with these, you know, accounts that are trying to sort of capitalize on your name. But anyways, you have to be verified to have songs associated with your profile, right? So for oh, me, I have songs okay. you can use as sounds, but on my profile, they're not linked. But if you go to, uh, you know, Olivia Rodrigo, she's verified. If you go to her profile and you tap, you know, the, the music icon, you can see all of the songs associated with her, right? And that helps with marketing because then people instantly connect that people will check what songs that you've made and it kind of legitimizes you as the creator of the songs and you can listen to it right there on TikTok. And with all these other distribution services like DistroKid and everything, you have to jump through all those hoops to get that. But I would like to see whether SoundOn is sort of a way to say like, hey, if you use this, we're already on TikTok. Now we know this is your song. You've distributed it through us. We can get you verification if you you know pay this premium plan. And it's kind of like, you know, another another way that they can increase their their hold on the on the music industry. It's it's an interesting thing because like DistroKid, for example, they as soon as you sign up for them, you know, if you get the right plan or whatever, I don't know all the details, but you yeah. you get a verified Spotify profile, right? Yeah. Whereas some of the other services, TuneCore, I don't think offers that. Um, I'm assuming SoundOn doesn't yet, but who knows? Uh and so that's that I mean, you go to a a Spotify profile and you see a blue check, and that just that it's kind of this weird thing we've been conditioned to with social media in general. Like, oh, that's a real person. And yeah. the truth is, like, the verification processes are really kind of they vary wildly across different platforms. The amount of times I've submitted for Instagram verification at this point is is crazy. You know, Same. Uh, yeah, and it's so weird to think like of course everybody is i'm sure they get millions of submissions every single day so it has to be algorithmic to some degree but it's kind of weird at some point it's like hey you know like hey this guy jordan's got like a million followers plus on tiktok maybe that's legit you know but at the yeah. same time i guess as i'm kind of processing this the the amount of times you get the uh, promoted on Beatles records uh, and you go over there and there's like 4 million quote unquote followers that are all bots, you know? Yeah. Uh, so maybe the, it isn't quite that simple. In fact, if you're listening out there, uh, anyone from Instagram, Facebook, uh, TikTok, whatever, come on and talk about it. We'd love to know more. Maybe but, make uh, this process less vague. Yeah, yeah. And I do know for, uh, not for a fact, but with some degree of certainty that Instagram and Facebook really value uh, mainstream media coverage as a part of yeah. their verification process, which is really interesting because they're supposed to be somewhat the alternative to that. So the fact that they want you to be in Rolling Stone to get verified is really weird. And additionally, and how legitimate does that source need to be? Yeah, exactly. Like yeah. how, how, up on the scale of things does it have like is is vanity fair good enough like is like or is bobsblog.com good enough like we don't really know for sure yeah and then the other side of it is you can tell there's industry connects right because there's bands it's like you have 3000 followers or whatever or, uh, i've seen even less and it's like you're verified oh but you're on this label yeah. Ah, I see. And so there's like, there's all this weird backdoor connectivity. And even through some of my contacts, I've gotten, you know, emails for certain people at Facebook. And I've been like, hey, 
I was told by this person and the, you know, it's radio silence, yeah. but you, you know that it's, it's a legit email. It went out for sure. Like you're, you know, and your, your connections have told you it's just this, this, this stuff is way murkier than I think the general public even understands to the degree yeah. that people still think that creators have control over what ads YouTube shows them. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a weird world that we live in. Either way, I don't know. My hot take is I don't think that Spotify verification means anything. I don't think it means a lot. You like know? a lot of the times when I'm like looking for music, I'm not really noticing. On, on Spotify, like that platform specifically, I think the only place where like the blue check mark would matter is on places where you can leave comments and have that blue check mark follow you, right? Mm -hmm. So like when you comment on someone, because, you know, on Spotify, you're not interacting with people, you're just listening to music. And like, if a song's a song, then it sounds good. So I don't care if the person is verified, because they're not really interacting with me. And like, I'm just listening, you know, I'm just consuming from their stuff, right? It's almost as if like, what if YouTube put up blue check marks? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if they do. But like, uh, I think they do, actually, or something similar. Yeah. Yeah. But like, when you go on TikTok, and like, let's say you're looking at a video and then you look in the comment section. If you see one of the comments has a blue check mark beside it, you know, wow, this person, they, they, it, it, it has become apparent that the app thinks they are worth a damn. Mm -hmm. So you're 10 times more likely to tap their name than just some other random person who has a top comment, right? Yeah. It kind of, it, it, it kind of creates this system of like, you know, these people are the, the ones who have clout and these are the people who are just you know regular posters when it could be the opposite right it could be as you said the person that has you know 300 followers in an industry connect versus someone that actually has you know 10 million followers but has never been written about in the in vanity fair or whatnot yeah. <laughs> and it's it's i think a combination of like the apps doing this on purpose like they want you know that drives engagement it's all about engagement, right? So if you see somebody with a blue check mark and you click on their name and you go to their profile and you scroll around a little bit, you are spending more time in the app. And that's ultimately what they want you to do. That's yeah. really all they care about, actually, at the end of the day, is how much time are you spending in the app so that potentially they can tell, you know, purple mattresses that this is how much time the average user spends in the app. For sure. And, and we can charge you this much for that. Like yeah. that's really the goal. The the thing about free quote unquote apps and social apps most prominently is if there's no charge to use it, you're the product. Yeah. And I think a lot of people forget that. Like uh, most people don't think about it in the in those terms. I hear people complaining about Facebook and and different things all the time and I'm like, "But what other free way do you have to connect to people at scale?" And that's what they're selling ultimately is yeah. is your eyeballs and you you have to remember that <laughs> you have to remember that that's what's really going on here i'm saying that to the audience at large here it's uh it's not really that nefarious it may seem more nefarious than when i say it that way like you are the product that makes it sound like some sort of orwellian construct but yeah. no it's just that's just how it works and uh i mean in the music world we can look at reverb as a decent example Reverb increased their fees a few years ago when they were bought by Etsy because they were literally losing money on the, everything they were doing. The whole Reverb idea was acquire users and then have an exit. And that is classic tech company stuff. That's what Instagram yeah. did. Like, I don't know that TikTok's going to do the same thing. I think their goals are a little bit larger than that. But that's what we're seeing here is... Acquire users, have exit. And uh, maybe this is kind of like gross to talk about for some people, but that's just the way it it works, you know? Yep. Tech companies are not your friends. They're not your friends. They're not your friends. You yeah. Doesn't mean you can't use them to your advantage, but they're not your friends. <laughs> for sure. It, exactly. It's kind of like, I remember seeing on TikTok, of course, someone who was doing like a skit video and they were talking to like themselves personified as like them as an artist and the other character as like, you know, a personification of TikTok and they walk in and they're like, hi, boss, like, I'd like a raise. And, you know, the TikTok's like, hi, how's it going? You know, what are you posting? Like, why do you think you deserve a raise? And he's like, 
well, I've been on this app for a long time and I've grown my platform and I have about 50,000 followers. So I bring a lot of people here and I think you should start paying me a bit more money. And they're like, well, we think you should start posting, you know, three to five times a day and maybe, you know, start posting videos where you're dancing and doing this. And he's like, but I just want to promote my music and maybe talk about it and maybe also make some money because I'm, I'm really working hard and like, you know, the more merit that you have on this app, maybe the more that I should get paid. And they're like, you know what, we're going to deactivate you now. Because yeah. <laughs> they can just do that, right? Yeah. You totally. see it all the time people with, you know, hundreds of thousands of followers who just get randomly algorithmically deactivated and have to start up new accounts. And it's kind of like for people who are uh, professional influencers, so to speak, um, when you're relying on TikTok or these different tech companies, whether TikTok or you know, previously Instagram, right? They sort of act as your employees, but like there's no real employee employer relationship they don't really owe you the sort of standard of care that a regular employer would owe you if you actually had a job right so if tiktok you know fires you or deletes your account what recourse do you have for the fact that you've essentially lost your income mm -hmm. like you don't right i think a lot of a lot of uh you know influencers know this and they know to convert and take their their fan base towards different avenues, right? Like Patreon or private discords or YouTube. And really, you know, you have to diversify. So like, this kind of goes with the whole point. Tech companies are not your friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's something really for any of the creators out there that are listening to this, whether you're a musician, artist of any sort, or, you know, maybe you're just making dank memes, like whatever <laughs> you're doing, you have to recognize that you don't have control. At you this have point. to have a plan. You have to think about what you're doing moving forward. You have to try to like, okay, I've got this attention now. And how can I funnel this into a way that's going to be effective moving forward? You know, you know, and, and some people don't like to think about that stuff, but the truth is like, there's only one Banksy, like only Banksy can be Banksy. And the odds that you're going to be that underground, like totally anonymous artist and actually have a degree of success is slim to none doesn't mean you shouldn't try if you really think that's you but uh it's it's not likely for most people we we kind of have to play this game again that's probably why you're here today <laughs> is that you saw something and that led you here maybe you saw jordan post about it maybe you saw me make a stupid meme maybe you saw any number of things maybe you heard me on a different podcast but you got here and if that's what you want to happen with your own music or art of any sort, you have to start thinking in some of these terms. And the reality is it's never been easy to be an artist. In fact, you could argue that recording and re recording technology enabled millions of artists to actually be able to make a living off their art where previously they would have just been a factory worker who, you know, strummed an acoustic sometimes, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's a tough thing. And I think, we sometimes lose perspective of the fact that most artists don't make a living from their their art and they never have for the history of humans and art. So, you know, take advantage of what you can while you can, I guess. For sure. And like, you know, some advice for that, speaking to that, there was another video that I, I was watching quite recently about the content problem where some guy... I don't know. I, I, I wish I could remember his name because it was actually a very, very interesting video and it very, very clearly summarized the problem between, you know, the conflicts between artists in these platforms and how the, the width of content versus the depth of content was kind of like the primary thesis he was talking about, about resolving this content issue because nowadays everything is just content, right? It doesn't matter what kind of art it is. It can be music. It could be TV. It could be, be even when people, you know, paint, making visual art. They have to film the process and then film it and then kind of present it towards like a trend and right. make it fit the, the content. But he was talking about like, you know, width of content, which is the number of people that you hit and the virality of your posts. That's just a splash, right? That's not going to make you any money. You have to focus on depth and depth being how uh, intimately and how powerfully it kind of connects with your core niche audience. And you know, to sort of make it as an artist, you have to go by the 1000 true fans principle, 
So yeah. like if you can make 1000 people who truly, truly uh, like, you know, align themselves with your goal and connect with your art and like you as a person and what you are doing, then that is enough to sort of sustain you, right? They can give you monetary value. They can act as, you know, walking advertisements as like a testament. And I know this kind of sounds very, you know, analytical and scientific, but like, you know, having the 1000 true fans is really like the best bet and one of the best strategies for small artists, because, you know, competing in this attention economy where you're literally just scrolling and engaged in several different worlds, like every single day, you have to have those 1000 people that will think about you when they're not actually on their phone. Yeah, definitely. And if we think about it, like maybe that Again, I keep using this term over and over again because I think that as artists, we've been conditioned to kind of think not in these terms. But that maybe that sounds gross to some people. But the reality is we all have artists that we connect with on that level. It doesn't matter whether that's, you know, Ariana Grande or some underground band. Like, I definitely have bands and artists that I think of when I'm in the shower. Like, not on the, not on the, the platforms at all. I'm just like totally out of my phone I'm like man i really want to listen to the replacements today you yeah. know like what makes me think that like well, i don't know i really like the band like well, like i want to listen to you know i really want to listen to gaslight anthem today oh why do i think that because i just love what they do yep and you know both of those bands were marketed to me in some way for me to get to where i had those feelings you know I had to Fandom hear the name. New, yeah. Yeah. I had to hear the name replacements like thousands and thousands of times before I actually checked out their music. And I finally did. I was like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> like, why have yeah. I not listened to this band before? You know, they were big in the eighties. Like <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a weird thing that, that we just have to accept has always kind of been the reality. We're just living yeah. in a new form of it. I, I believe. Of course. And I think that also brings up new like challenges for artists, right? Because, uh, you know, the, 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 the way that these apps are able to allow us to communicate with each other in terms of like streaming and commenting and being able to just like, you can go on Instagram right now and send a DM to John Mayer and like, it's his choice to respond to it. Right. Right. And <laughs> that, that kind of creates like a new level of fandom that goes in towards this concept of parasocial relationships where like, you know, in gaining these 1000 true fans, it's a very, very difficult tightrope to walk sometimes. And even I find this when I'm streaming to sort of keep a distance from your fans in a way to let them know, like, hi, I'm very, very glad that you like my music. I appreciate the fact that you're here. Like, I'm sure you're a very nice person, but like, we're not close, close friends. Like you, we don't really know each other, whether you're on like a different part of the world, but like, you know, it's, it's becoming a thing more and more with, Twitch streaming and with, you know, YouTube lives and YouTubers and people, content posters who post their content multiple times a day, when sometimes certain fans will think that they are actually your friends, especially when this person is responding to comments or responding to DMs or engaging with them in the stream. And they think they have a connection that's transcends fandom towards actually being like good friends. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's obviously people that will take that very seriously and they will you know, on the creator side, there's creators that will, you know, go ahead and state, I am not your friend. This is not a paranormal or a parasocial relationship. I'm glad you like the content. But there's also those people that will actually like remember their fans names from like stream to stream, and actually like respond to their DMs and have long form conversations. And it kind of creates like a strange environment out there. Where, you know, it, it, it's ultimately unhealthy, right? Because it, it relies on the assumption that these fans like these people forming the parasocial relationships aren't going to want to take it even further than that you know and as a creator it's very very important to be careful of that and to sort of learn how to healthily healthily navigate that relationship that is a a really really good point and i know we're getting close to the end but i th yeah. think that was that hit home with me especially because i sort of fall into the latter category where I do try to engage with everybody to the degree that is physically possible. And sometimes it's not physically possible anymore. It's starting to get to that point. And that's, I'm not complaining at all. I'm, I'm just like stating reality. Like sometimes I can't reply to everybody. And I have people who listen to the show that like will send me like five memes a day. And yeah. 
I love that they do that and they they know it's always good. Like it's always it's never been like anything too weird except for one time in the very beginning, but we don't need to get into that. Uh, <laughs> but it's always it's always been positive. It's always been a good interaction at yeah. the end of the day. And you know, I uh, I appreciate it and I want it to continue, but I I feel like I let them down when I don't respond. Yeah. And I I know that, that they probably feel a little bit let down because they're used to me responding. And I just simply, like, it's just, I've said before, like, I, I get somewhere between all the accounts I manage and, and just what I do, it's probably higher than this now, but like 100 to 150 different forms of messages a day. And at some point, I'm just going to break. <laughs> Like I can't, I can't physically do that all myself anymore. So, I, uh, I, that really resonated strongly with me. You, you were like, some people say, "No, I'm not going to answer you," and I've always been like, "I'm going to answer you." Uh, exactly. So Especially I'm sorry if I didn't to, answer yeah. you. <laughs> There's pressure to do that when you're trying to like grow your brand, right? You want to on on a, especially on a place like TikTok where people very much value like honest engagement from their creators, right? People are very anti the whole brand thing, right? Yeah. Something like the reason why the the Fender TikTok doesn't have a lot of engagement right now is because they post very, very corporate forward videos. Everything's very polished. Everything's from like an animator or something they obviously paid. And you see the comments, they're not really engaging. They're not being funny, like the Duolingo Owl or like Ryanair, where they actually get in and they talk and they come up with funny retorts, right? They'll just kind of drop a couple heart emojis and their comments are full of people saying, send me a free guitar. Send me a free guitar. I want a free guitar. Give me a free oh, guitar yeah. now. Oh yeah. I and get that And their videos too. get no views. <laughs> so it's kind of like, you know, when, when you have to keep up that personality to sort of reinforce, I am a real person. I am behind the camera. This is my personal life and I would love to chat with you. That's what people want. Um, it, it just creates all those problems of navigating the parasocial relationships. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a I I guess I should say it's it's a good problem to have, you know? Like yeah. it's it's not I'm not trying to complain about it. It's just expressing like, hey, this is this is something that we we all do have to deal with. And again, like that doesn't mean I want you to stop sending me messages. It's just I may not be able to respond to the degree that I used to. And that means that we're doing things right. You know, it means yeah. that we're actually, you know, making progress and, and getting more traction. And I'm going to continue to to try to maintain that to the best of my ability, but it sometimes isn't possible. Although I always do respond to the text chat, listeners. So <laughs> <laughs> until it gets too big, but right now it's manageable. Yeah. You know, you, that actually is a good point. You got to prioritize certain things, right? Like if For you sure. responded to every single DM, you'd probably never get anything else done. But you know, if there's channels that are more important, you know, I think every creator has that to whatever degree that, you know, they, they know what's important to them yeah, and what is required. And they'll like, I'm sure like every creator responds to like every patron they can on Patreon to the degree it's possible, you know, maybe last pod sure. podcast on the left can't do that, but like most other things probably can. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a weird, weird world we're living in. It's kind of like, at what point do you, like, how big does your fandom have to be before you just can completely stonewall everyone and just not respond and kind of live your life and be a public figure, right? Like, if you're freaking Paul McCartney, he's not responding right. to DMs. He doesn't care. He's just like, <laughs> people like him. People listen to his music and you're never going to hear a word from him. He's going to live his private life. And it's like, can the average creator even do that now? Right, like I think so for up and comers. Think, yeah, I think so. I think it just gets to a point, and everybody knows where that point is for themselves. You know. Yeah. I I don't think anybody DMs John Mayer and expects him to respond really, except maybe like a yeah. maybe a legitimately unhinged person. Like nobody, <laughs> nobody thinks he's going to respond, and when he does, that's why you get a screenshot of it and it goes kind of viral. Yeah. Because you know, it's so rare, it goes viral because it's not common. Yeah. You know, but most of the time people aren't responding to their DMs when they get to that level. And probably even smaller to to some degree. That doesn't sure. mean they don't want you to DM sometimes. It just means don't expect anything. Just shoot your shot. <laughs> you know, yeah. maybe, maybe it'll happen. 
for sure. <laughs> well, this was a uh, a very interesting conversation. I I uh, thought it might go this way, but we really we really peeled back the layers of the onion on this one, and I'm uh, I'm glad we did. I hope that yes. gives the listeners a little more insight into this weird world that we find ourselves in, and uh, I hope we didn't say anything that hurt anybody's feelings because I think we were pretty blunt <laughs> with some of this stuff. But, uh, dude, thank you for coming on. This was this was really awesome. Yeah, it's good to talk to you. Thanks for having me. Of course. Well, since we uh, didn't get into the classic questions, we're going to go ahead and do that real quick. But before I do that, this is your chance to you know talk to a, a few thousand people and plug anything you want to plug, shout out anybody you want to shout out. The floor is yours, so go for it. How's it going, guys? You can, uh, you can obviously check me out on TikTok if you want. I'm also starting up a YouTube channel where I'm going to start doing a bit more in-depth gear demos. So that's going to be pretty cool. Um, I got music on Spotify as well. You can check me out on Instagram. I have all my websites. Um, and if you happen to catch the odd time when I, I throw, I build custom pedals too. So if you happen to catch the odd one on my reverb, feel free to check that out as well. There you go. That's Jordan.wave everywhere, right? Yes. Okay, cool. All right, classic questions. Here we go. These are the final two. Okay. Number one, what is your favorite boss pedal? Blues Driver. Oh, like this one right here. Yes. <laughs> love Sorry the if that's blues a basic driver. one, but uh, <laughs> I love the Blues Driver. I'm I I am a recent uh con- convert to the Blues Driver. I, like I've played them before, and I remember really liking them. And then a listener, uh, John Schick, shout out John Schick, he uh sent me one for Christmas, and yeah. I really really like it a lot, like more than I. More than I even remembered. So Blues Driver is a great pick. I it's the it. best for stacking. Throw a throw a treble boost behind it. Mm-hmm. I roll the tone completely off. Um, drive to wherever you want, and then treble boost behind it. And that was like my lead tone for like an entire year of shows. Great, great pedal. We didn't even touch on the fact that like I think you are a monster of a player. By the way, like yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> I was like watching some of your videos. I'm like, geez, this guy rips. Like. You are very good. So that's also probably uh, part of why you're doing so well. So, yeah. I hope so. Yeah. (laughs) Great player, dude. All right. Final question. And this is the controversial one. This is the one that gets a little dicey. Okay. What is your favorite kind of pizza? Meat Supreme. Ooh. Whatever the Meat Supreme is at at your local pizzeria, that's probably what I would would get. Mm Mm-hmm. Do you like a thin crust, a thick crust, a specific regional style, or just kind of meat supreme uh, anywhere? I, like a, I like a thick crust. Oh, you like a thick crust? Like a yeah. Sicilian or like even like a Detroit, maybe? Oh, these, these are regional, these are regional pizzas that I'm <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big like pizza whatever, nerd. whatever the, the classic fast food drunk food pizza in your area is. Okay. I got you. We have a few of those too. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> Any uh, local pizzeria to you that you want to plug real quick? Pizza Fresca on uh, it's on College Street in Toronto. I love it. It's great. Best pizza in Toronto. Also right. like a, a bit of a basic choice, but I also like Maker's Pizza when I feel like shelling out like $30 for a pie. Anyways. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you got to do it, you know? Yeah. I love it. Well, dude, thank you so much for coming on. This was a great time and uh, I'm sure we're going to get into some more nerdy stuff on Patreon. Sounds good. All right. All right. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, dude. For Jordan, this is Blake. And as always, folks, good luck and good tones. All right. There you go, folks. I hope you enjoyed that one. Jordan and I dove into a bunch of other stuff over on the bonus episode. So if you like this podcast, you want to help keep it going, and you want extra content, you can go to patreon.com slash tone mob, where for just five bucks a month, you can get extra episodes beamed directly to your ears every week. And seriously, it helps so much. I know five bucks doesn't sound like that much, especially considering inflation these days, but it really does go a long ways. It really does help out a lot. It uh, literally helps keep the lights on. It pays my electrical bill. So thank you so much to everybody that's done that. And if you can't do that 
as always, I would just ask, please do the free thing and let's amplify this signal. Let's get it out there to more people. If there is anyone you can think of that might enjoy any episode of this podcast for any reason, please send this their way because that is really what keeps this thing going beyond all else. If no one listened to this at this point, even I, with my stubborn nature, probably would have hung it up a long time ago. So thank you very much for tuning in. I'll talk to you on the internet very soon. Bye-bye. One last thing before we totally sign off here. I just want to remind you that if you do any shopping at Stringjoy, that's Stringjoy Guitar Strings made in Nashville, that will help me out as well. As I've said for years, I'm heavily involved in that company, and I really do think they're making the best products on the market. So if you would like to try custom strings, go to ToneMob.com Stringjoy and check them out today. I seriously, seriously, seriously love what the team down there is doing. I help them out with all kinds of things, and by you supporting them, you are also supporting me as well. And hey, you need some strings, so why not get some custom strings just for your guitar and playing style? Again, the link for that is ToneMob.com Stringjoy, and that will take you right to their website, and you can do all your shopping through there, and that will help everyone involved out. So thank you very much. Talk to you next time. We are brought to you by the wonderful folks at Gun Street Wiring Shop. Yes, Gun Street Wiring Shop. I've talked about them before. I used to say based out of Bend, Oregon, but guess what? Sean moved to my neck of the woods. Sean's in Portland. Sean is awesome and has helped me with a bunch of stuff lately. And if you have wiring needs for your guitar, he can help you too. If you want to get weird with it, he can get weird. If you just need to spruce things up a little bit, there's your guy. He takes all the guesswork out of doing your guitar wiring, and he makes it simple, and his customer service is top-notch, and I can't say enough good things about Gunstreet as a company. I really respect Sean and what he's all about, and the product is top-notch. I've got three different guitars that now have Gunstreet harnesses in them, and I could not be happier. So go to GunstreetWiringShop.com and check them out.